So I'm pretty sure I don't need to tell you this, but uh, the current state of affairs could uh, be vastly improved. I mean, I, like the rest of you, am stuck at home. I, hopefully not like the rest of you, have been out of work in an industry that's got its own struggles. And I'm certainly suffering from this creeping sense that the world is closing in on me just a little bit more every day. But you know, one great thing has happened to me in all of this. Around the end of 2020, close people who I haven't been in close contact with uh, for a long time have reconnected. All friends of often more than a decade that had been reduced to just check-ins on social media all of a sudden are messaging and texting and talking. And the truth is, it's been like coming outside to a warm, bright sun breaking through the clouds after a week of rain. I reached out to one such friend of mine who I met back when we were working together at Disney Animation in the late 1990s. She came to Los Angeles from the Deep South to be an actress, just as I came to L.A. from New York to claim my stardom. We both worked at Disney Animation in tech, and we both had chances to do things like scratch voices for Disney movies. And, and when the time came that we each left to do our own thing and go our own separate ways in different places, she got the shot at her dream of living in London. We're all traveling a strange path each day during the time of COVID. I've been lucky to find a relief valve in reconnection. And that's something I can highly recommend you try to bring a rasher of joy into your life these days. It's definitely something I'm going to continue to work on going forward. Born in Nashville, Dara McGarry worked at Disney Feature Animation for 14 years before trading her mouse ears for a bowler hat. She moved to London in 2010 to work as an artist manager at Double Negative, a visual effects and animation studio. Besides traveling around Europe when that was still a thing, seeing theater on the West End and historic sites around the UK, Dara was also a regular at the storytelling event One Track Minds which recounts stories of songs that changed her life. She became a British citizen in October of 2020. Dara, welcome to the podcast. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you on here. I've known you for, my God, would you believe it's probably 25 years? Though we haven't spoken in probably the last 10 uh, or so. That's a long yes. time. It it is a long time. Uh, time is just kind of like racing by these days, um, especially in in a world where we're all locked in our houses <laughs> most of the time. Um, why don't Why don't you uh, talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay. Um, well, I uh, am. First of all, I am Dara McGarry, and in the UK, I am known as Dara. So when I first came here to work in 2010 at uh, Double Negative, which is a post-production house in London, my boss said to me on my second day, he said, yeah, so um, about that name, um, we're going to call you Dara uh, because they felt like you were putting on a, a fake American accent to say Dara. We can't say <laughs> We're going to call you Dara. Uh, and I didn't really have a choice in the matter. So um so here it, I'm known as Dara. Does it bother you? I don't hear it anymore. I just okay. sort of, um, yeah, I, I, I just answered to anything people call me, <laughs> 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 which, which uh, uh, can be colorful at times. But um, so uh, I'm currently the operations manager at DNEG, which is it's rebranded. Double Negative is now DNEG. Uh, it's still a post-production house in London, but it also has a feature animation division of uh -huh. which I am the operations manager. And that's like, um, you know, the game operations. Yeah. The, the, the you know, with the, Try, the bone and, yeah, and the. Yeah. Try to remove parts from something without blowing it up. Yeah. Right. I got it. <laughs> and if you hit the edge, then it would go. Ah! Yep. Yeah. Yep. That, that's my job is, is to sort of watch everything and then go. Ah! Stop doing that. <laughs> What uh, what projects have you guys worked on? 
So uh, we have just completed a film called Ron's Gone Wrong with Locksmith Animation. And that is going to be distributed by Disney and the release date is in October. So we're, we're very excited. Uh, it was, nice. uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're pushing the release date a bit so that it can be seen in cinemas, which we're very, very excited about because um, uh, we thought, well, we, we initially thought it was going to go in the cinemas. Then we're like, mm, I guess it's going to stream because will cinemas ever open again? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Very cool. So how's life in London? I, I've spoken to I've spoken to somebody who's in France so far as part of this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I've spoken to people who has have family in Asia and have family in other parts of Europe. But you're the first person I've spoken to who's in uh, who's in London, which is a country that not only is dealing with the pandemic, but is also dealing with all kinds of other stuff. So. What's what's life like? <laughs> um, it's I love it. I'll just preface everything by saying that that I'm a huge Anglophile, and I always thought that I would end up living in the UK. And hey, I did it! Yay, <laughs> I'm here. So uh, I love all of the quirky aspects. I love that um, if I walk down the street just a smidge, there's a pub that's been there for about 500 years. Yeah. And apparently yeah. Oliver Cromwell used to gather his troops there and go in a secret tunnel to a, a little island in the middle of the Thames and have secret meetings. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like a five minute walk away. That's awesome. I, I've, I've been to London once. I went in 1984, I think it was. And just going into Westminster Abbey, going oh. down into the crypts, just I, I felt like I needed to go lay down afterwards. Uh, the the impact of being someplace you know looking at Isaac Newton's tomb and and I'm like oh my goodness <laughs> so I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt oh no 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 it, it, it's so true Westminster Abbey is that's one of my favorite places in fact that is where I went right after I got my citizenship um I did my ceremony in in pandemic conditions it was just October so I went up to Islington Town Hall and they they were cranking people through in 10 minute intervals because normally it's a big group and you sing uh, God save the queen and probably Jerusalem and all the, the sort of UK anthems. Uh, but in this case, you just sort of run in with a mask on, stand in front of a portrait of the queen, read an oath, and then they give you a piece of paper, take your picture and kick you out. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty fast just to, keep the traffic moving as it were. But sure. um, as soon as I got my, my citizenship, I went straight to Westminster Abbey just to walk through and, and feel that this, this huge collection of, of extremely important historical events, Kings are buried there, Queens, yeah. poets, scientists, everybody that, that has been so influential to Western civilization, especially in my mind, then, yeah. To, to go and, and celebrate and sort of feel like well, I'm part of it now. That was, yeah. um, that was a beautiful day. So That's yeah. Very West cool. It's overwhelming. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Very cool. So, you know, we had day-to-day life going for a long time. Everything was normal. You were working at DNEG and making movies. And then all of a sudden the world changed. Uh, I guess it's almost a year now that we've all been in this strange position. What was it like when word came down that, you know, things were going to start shutting down? What was it like in, in Great Britain when that happened? And, and sort of reflecting back on it, I've put more importance on events than what I initially thought they, they were. Because I remember last January most people traveled for Christmas and coming back. So middle of January, it was really strange how many people in my crew had the flu or pneumonia. Mm. And we thought, wow, must be a really bad flu this year. Ah. And then we started hearing the reports of like, Oh, there's a really, really bad flu, like really bad flu. Oh, this is, this is scary. Um, It's, it's very contagious. It's um, very severe. And so I started hearing people on the crew saying, oh, I'm really worried about traveling. And it 
I kind of thought at first that people were being alarmist. And I remember it escalating in February. And I, I actually wrote in my journal about how stressed I was because so many people were coming to me and worried about taking the tube into work, worried about being in contact when the, this this deadly flu is going around. And I remember right. thinking that I thought people were kind of overstating it and overreacting. And then I talked to one of my artists who was from Italy. He was from uh, around Milan. And his family are doctors and nurses. They all work in hospitals. And he is one of the, my artists that had the uh, that had pneumonia in, in January when he came back from Italy. And he was explaining that they could tell that now it was it was coronavirus and his dad who the doctor was having to make decisions about who could go on the ventilator or not and that that was back in february so that's when it hit me that this is really serious so then we started talking about making plans but what what does this actually mean and of course at that point the studio there was no way studios would let us work from home right we weren't we were really confused about how this was going to work and they had started asking the studios to get permission and, and security clearance to do the work from home and, and take stuff back, take equipment back, um, network into the the mainframes, all of that, which was just absolutely forbidden before. So we didn't think we were going to get clearance. And then suddenly, as it got into March, it was like we absolutely needed to get clearance because more and more of my crew were not coming in. Right. And so they were right. opting to stay at home without pay rather than travel in to work because they were vulnerable or their partner was vulnerable. So um, miraculously, when um, it was the 20th of March, when the prime minister announced that the UK was going to go into lockdown effective immediately, Right. So, uh, or at least at midnight, because he gave everybody a chance to go to the pub one last time <laughs> and try yeah. to drink up the stock because they didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Uh, especially the beer. I mean, the spirits will last, obviously, but but the beer, you know, that goes off. So everybody was out drinking heavily that night. But <laughs> I, I, I specifically remember leaving my desk and thinking, okay, it'll probably be about three weeks or so. Uh, what do I not need for three weeks? And so then I kind of bagged stuff up, gave it one last, like, I think even took a picture of it and, and then walked out. And the, the weird thing is that we have very few people that do have to go into the studio to see the final color on a a screen. Yep. Certain things can't be done remote. Yeah. Yeah. Really hard to do that. So when I have meetings with those guys, one of them sits right in front of my desk and I'm just... I'm so distracted. I'm looking on my my desk the way it was a year ago, like a little time capsule. Yeah, yeah. I I had a um, I had a strange experience like that um, in the uh, sometime in like November. I had to go to uh, a mall to pick up a piece of equipment because there was no other way to get it at a reasonable time. And this was before we went into our our latest round of lockdowns here mm-hmm. in Southern California. Mm-hmm. And um, I went to a place called the Americana, which is up in Glendale. And I don't know if it was there when you were here last, but yeah, yeah, it's I love one the of Americana. these big outdoor malls, right? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm at, I'm at the Apple store. I get what I need. And as we're leaving uh, my wife and I, we make a round just to walk around to get some exercise. And I'm looking at the movie theater there and the marquee has all of the big movies from Christmas, 2019 still on there. Right. Oh. It's like they shut down at the end of 2019 and they went home and they've done nothing to change it. So it was this weird moment of being frozen in the past. Yeah. Um, that was very uh it was both bizarre and disquieting to to yeah. look at it. Is it it's it's so it's it's freaky. It's just genuinely freaky. Um there are some there are few small boutique shops that have never reopened and right then in, in March, that was very close to Mother's Day in the UK, which is called uh, Mothering Day. And so there was lots of sweet little window decorations for moms and, you know, get your mom's yeah. flowers, those, that sort of thing. And to still see that is just kind of creepy, along with um, fashions from the spring summer collection of 2020. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, now it's all like uh, uh, pajamas, which by the way, I think I've been wearing some kind of pajama or uh, maybe occasionally running trousers, as we would say, <laughs> uh, uh, pretty much every day for a year. Yeah, it's it's going to be a vastly different world when we all emerge back into it again, uh, I think. Um, was getting the production processes uh, to work from at home really complicated or did it just kind of, were they able to get it to just work quickly? So our, for the artist, it seemed amazingly seamless. Of course, everybody had issues connecting and couldn't mm-hmm. figure out VPN and stuff, but that's normal. It's that was the normal kind of like my yeah. code doesn't work because you're using the wrong code. You know that. Sort of <laughs> yeah. Um, so so there was a lot of that. So of course it took uh, a solid couple of weeks to get everybody really truly up and running. But the yeah. fact that they practically overnight our tech team and and by the way I don't think they slept for two weeks and I, yeah. I truly mean that um, they. They got everybody, we got hardware out to people who had taken monitors and it, it broke on the way or something. Um, they did the tech support to get people up and running. And in a couple of weeks, we had about 800 people working from home. And it was wow. it was unbelievable and, and something we never, ever, ever thought was humanly possible. Yeah. So I really applaud our tech team. They were outstanding. I've been hearing those stories all over, right? Uh, it was remarkable to watch, unfortunately for me, from afar, because I've I've been kind of home for a long time, not working. How quickly all of those things we swore we would never be able to do mm-hmm. if we had to in, in businesses like visual effects and animation just moved, mm-hmm. you know? And I know it wasn't transparent. Uh, it was transparent to the end users. I guess in some respects, if we're going to have a global pandemic that's this kind of petrifying to business, this was the right time in history for it to happen because things like internet and video conferencing technologies have hit a point where everybody can use them, right? Because you remember 15 years ago, doing a video conferencing session required two engineers and a dedicated data circuit, right? And $100,000 worth of computer equipment to do it. And and nowadays, you know, my laptop and its built-in camera takes care of it. So, oh, I, I was I was just going to say, and that that's also why I think we're able to function certainly in feature animation as well as we do because of the advances in just the software. That what we're able to do from home yeah. is is phenomenal. The the thing that I think in our industry is is struggling the most is just the live action so the the vfx end of our company is kind of waiting for the the live action shoots to get up and going again right it's it's the actual raw content not the the ability to do the effects on it right exactly exactly so until enough things are shot and it's it's kind of interesting to hear that they'll start to go on set for some things and then uh, and then there's an outbreak and they have to shut it down and then it's yeah. back there and then it's yeah. back there. So it, it'll get there. Yeah, no, without a doubt. Uh, it's been actually watching it. It's been fairly successful uh, restarting here in LA anyway uh, for television. Um, it seems to me that since the industry put down its standards and started enforcing them and opened production up again. We haven't heard of any like regular television series work shutting down uh, because of the pandemic. They did extend the hiatus over the holidays because we had an outbreak in Los Angeles, which was no surprise because half of Los Angeles behaves and, and follows the rules. And then the other half um, thinks it won't happen to them. So they don't feel they have to. And then, about a third of that group is, you know, waving the flag and going freedom, which, you know, <laughs> if freedom to die would be fine if it weren't killing everybody else. Right. <laughs> um, so, so what's it like there? Is it, are, are, are they, I mean, we have a, we have a particularly partisan kind of environment here in the United States at the moment that's um, strangely maybe going to work. It's, it's either going to work its way out to normalcy again, or we're going to blow ourselves up. And, and I think it's still kind of, kind of bouncing around at the moment to figure it out. But what's it been like in in, um, in England? 
Well, um, in terms of the pandemic, uh, that's very interesting because it sort of depends on what neighborhood you're in. So I live in a, um, in a suburb and there's a lot of what we would call yummy mummies, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, which you could describe as, uh, let's see, how would I describe that? Um, trophy wives with lots of children. <laughs> Got it. Okay. But, uh, um, and then there are more elderly out here as well. So, so it's this really strange combination of sort of young people who don't think that they will ever get it. So they're, they're young enough to believe that they're immortal. And then the people who are very vulnerable, who are yelling at them. So, I mean, it's, it's just a more modern day equivalent of, Hey kid, get off my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> hey kid, put on the mask or I'll die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's, it, it's it's very strange. It is two very different cultures. They don't that often clash. I don't see people rioting because, well, that would be rude. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> um, so they, they will just go on to a, a message board and complain. <laughs> that's, that's the outlet for it. Hey, you know, there's there's something to be said for that, right? But. <laughs> I guess we in the United States are who we are because the Brits were smart enough to kick all of the troublemakers out and send them to North America. <laughs> uh, well, okay. They sent the Puritans to North America. They sent the troublemakers to Australia right. who eventually wound up just having a lot of fun and drinking a lot of beer. Yes. But we, but the Puritan part here has got everybody really confused. Really <laughs> right. confused. It's very true. And, and partisan to this day. Yeah. 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 It's uh yeah, it's been uh it's been interesting here. Um there there is this aside from the denial aspect of it, right? There's the disease is weird in the way it plays out. Some people get it and you never have any symptoms at all. Some people get it and they get a little bit of mild flu and it goes away in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Some people get it and they're on a, a respirator and dead two weeks later, right? Um mm -hmm. And there are indications of which way you'll land, but generally speaking, anybody can land in any of those three categories. So there are a lot of people who have had no exposure to somebody being sick who don't believe it's a big deal. And then there are people, um, and I'm thinking particularly of New York City, which experienced a really bad outbreak early in the process back in March of last year, uh, last year where, you know, New Yorkers had the experience of driving by the local hospital and seeing the refrigerated trucks out behind it as, as mortuary overflows. And then, and then there's just the, the weird socioeconomic piece of it, right? They're in the wealthier communities. Cause we have some other political issues that have gone on here over the last few years, um, which I'm sure you've heard about. Um, <laughs> just a little. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, they decided to adopt things like wearing a mask as a, you know, uh, as a let's let's uh, screw with the liberals by mm -hmm. not, not wearing masks. And I'm like, I, I don't I've never fully understood the mindset for that because, you know, I'm not the most educated person in the world, but I can figure out that if I don't spit in your face and you don't spit in my face and the virus travels in our spit. Odds are we won't pass it on between each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and and yet there there are a lot of folks who just are in some kind of denial or don't get it. And then, of course, we had the holidays come. I don't know whether or not you guys had the same kind of spike we did, but everybody here insisted that I don't care if it kills grandma. I'm going to her house for Thanksgiving. Yeah. I'm going to get on airplanes and I'm going to travel. And no matter how much people were kind of warned not to do it, they did it anyway. And then, as one would expect, uh, three weeks after Thanksgiving, everything spiked, right? Yeah. So yeah. so naturally, they did the only reasonable thing. They got on airplanes to go away for Christmas and New Year's as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so we're finally, as we roll into February, the numbers have stabilized and, our, and, and the projection is that they'll come down again. But we literally, and I, I live in uh, Redondo Beach, which is the South Bay area of LA. We literally ran out of hospital beds for a, a, a couple of weeks because of this. Yeah. And I, I don't understand 
why people don't seem to get it. What was what what was the experience there like? Um, well, there's uh, they built hospitals in different cities in the UK called Nightingale. Um, I think it's technically Nightingale Hospital after Florence Nightingale, of course. Okay. And uh, so the one in London was at a convention center. Okay. It was huge. And that was meant for the hospital overflow. And originally when they built it in the summer, it didn't get a lot of use. So, of course, the deniers were, were claiming that – you know, this is all pointless and it doesn't exist. And this is a waste of money, et cetera, et cetera. But I do believe, although I do not have proof of this, that it did get used over Christmas because the day of, of the inauguration, so 20th of January, that was the highest death rate so far. I think it went up in the days just after the 20th. And it started to go back down now, but that was the the highest death rate so far of the entire pandemic in the UK. Okay. So we had the same thing where, of course, we don't have Thanksgiving, so people didn't go away for you know that's just a Thursday over right. here. But right. um, I did make tofurkey. I want you to know. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> whatever floats your boat. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, and then I think I made oh yeah I made sweet potatoes for um, my social bubble who are all English and had never had anything like that before and <laughs> couldn't oh. understand why it's a side dish and not a dessert. Oh is, okay, that's yeah. fair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can um, see that. Yeah, yeah, I know everything has sugar and you have to explain. So, um, so, so the spike here it made sense that it was in January because it was from the Christmas traveling. Um, I had a lot of artists. So uh, in in my, my artist population, um, about 30% roughly are EU citizens. And okay. so many of them went back. Uh, a lot of them went back in March because as soon as the pandemic hit, they foresaw what this was going to be and said, um, if I'm going to have to stay home, I'm going to stay home next to a beach. Bye. <laughs> So, okay. Like, hey, I don't blame you. Or, or they wanted to be with their grandparents or something. So, so a lot of people went and then eventually are are still stuck where they can't get back in because they've closed the travel. Like the borders are still closed, mostly. Okay. Um, and the borders are closed because of the um, the pandemic, or the borders closed because of the the uh, because of Brexit. Well, mostly, um, <laughs> was, yeah, yeah, see, it's kind of funny how those played in together, isn't it? So, yeah. um, so the borders are closed technically to travelers from certain countries. So there's, there's travel corridors that are closed entirely right now. Uh, some are still open. And then I believe the current travel advice is when you do land, I think now you have to travel with a proof of a negative test okay um otherwise you have to quarantine but okay. currently the quarantine is uh, you're at the airport and they say do you have a negative test you say no and they say okay go quarantine and then that's the end of that so okay no one checks no they, they don't check yeah, they don't trace well, you can just go do anything you want i mean you're not supposed to but you know yeah. again okay. that would be rude so <laughs> um so that's kind of how that works but so here's the complication with with Brexit. So, a the food is having trouble getting over the borders because they only agreed the trade agreement uh, for certain aspects like the fishing waters and things like that. But some there was some food involved with that. Okay, that was only agreed like on the 30th of December. It was very very last minute. So a lot of the distributors weren't sending food from Europe. So when I, for example, went to the shop to get wine for inauguration day, my choice was entirely English wine, which by the way, is not at the top of my drinking list. <laughs> okay. Because all the French wine was gone and, and the new shipments had not come in. So um, we're waiting for food and uh, I get a, a vegetable box on Sundays and of, you know, you know like an organic veg box yeah. Basically. Yeah. and, and they're having trouble getting food in. So they have to rely on domestic food, which is lovely, but you know, you're not going to get avocados. Uh, true. 
that's true. Uh, so that hasn't caught up yet. The flow of goods back and forth, it's still. Slow. No, it's still problematic. And there's just a lot of the pandemic makes it worse because there's very, very, very long lines at the border with the, the trucks. Right. What about uh, workers? You've talked about how you have a a staff that's based in all different parts of the EU and travel used to be free. Uh, how has that all changed for you guys? <laughs> well, it's certainly challenging. Um, we used to do a lot of outreach to the European animation schools and we'd go and, and meet the students and judge the the graduate uh, programs or graduate films. Many, many um, universities over here make short films for their graduate programs and they're excellent, really, really lovely work. Yeah. So we always enjoyed going to see that. Uh, but now I'm limited, whereas before I could hire an EU person into their first job the same as a UK person, but with right. Brexit... That EU person now requires a visa, but being a graduate wouldn't qualify for one. Oh, was there some kind of framework already in place to decide how different visas worked and what the immigration laws would be prior to this? Or are they kind of seat of the pants working it out now? Well, there's. it seems like, again, seems like there was a plan, but they only started to change the visas in, I think that was, the plan was rolled out rather. Uh, gosh, I think that was September or October to wow. us. Wow. Okay. So it seemed late in the game. But I think part of that was that there was a lot of uh, discussion on how this was all going to work, a lot of arguing back and forth. So I think there were a lot of plans that were on standby. I was just waiting to see what actually was going to go through. So that was kind of the whole thing about Brexit is, is you know, that was voted in in 2016. Right. So, uh, remember that dark year that started I, off with the death of Bowie? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember. I remember watching the whole process and thinking, well, between the nonsense going on here and the nonsense going on there, it's the whole world's coming apart, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, to me, always for the rest of my life, I will consider the death of Bowie to be the unraveling of the fabric yeah. of society. Yeah, <laughs> it, it marks it marks the moment in history. That's true. <laughs> it does so um, it was it was interesting. So they voted for it, and then of course everybody argued back and forth. And then when it was definitive, like this is going to happen. Okay, well, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, no, we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, oh we have to go negotiate treaties now. We haven't had to do that in like seventy years. Okay, well I guess we'll go figure it out. Yeah. What does this do? To, I mean, not that it's an issue at the moment because of the pandemic, but what does this do to travel? Right. I mean, I imagine you've spent many years traveling all over Europe because of how easy it is to do that. Yes. From yeah, I love doing that. And someday we'll do it again. So London is a fantastic hub for Europe, for sightseeing all over. I mean, I can take um, a flight for an hour and be in Germany or South France or uh, Spain, northern Spain. Um, a little bit longer, you can be in Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, Amsterdam, Take a train nice. to Amsterdam. So, you know, you, nice. can, you yeah. can get around. And from L.A., I think, wow, if I take a plane for an hour, I'll be in Barstow. <laughs> yeah, you Vegas. You can make it to Vegas. <laughs> yeah. If you want to go someplace where you can drink, it's Vegas. <laughs> yeah. yep. so, uh, so I do, I really do love that. Uh, when, when the travel opens up again, then I expect initially the flights will be cheap and then they'll be really expensive. <laughs> I think uh, because yeah. everybody's going to want to travel again. Um, but in terms of traveling to the EU, so you have to have a, a visa. So you, in other words, you have to have your passport stamped, but I always did anyway as an American. So right. basically traveling around Europe just stays the same to me. I still have to stand in line and get a stamp. All right. That makes sense. What is, uh, how are you feeling about the next six months knowing the way the world is right now? Um, I, I am a very interested observer. I can't wait to find out how it's going to play out. I mean, I'm literally can't imagine. And we happen to be very busy at work right now. So I, I feel like I spend, so, so I'm, I'm not really 
lacking in stuff to do because I'm working so many hours. So I really am just sort of looking through out through my window out into the garden and then occasionally looking at the news to see what is happening on the outside world. So for in a way for me, it's kind of just my living room for the next six months. <laughs> really, right. Like I'm kind of stuck here, but uh, wondering what is going to happen to everybody else is really curious. I expect, Oh, by the way. So I did get my rough date for when I would get my vaccine, which is in June. Okay. Well, that's good. Yep. So I can plan that far in advance. Okay. So, okay. Um, that, congratulations. That means as messed up as the government is, you at least have a plan that you're working off of to get there. Cause yeah. here in the U S we're finally starting to try to pull our act together uh, a little bit since the administration changeovers happened, but it's been just absolute chaos. And, and personally, I like to think that we'll have a decent we'll start to get back into something resembling something normal uh, by fall yeah. because uh, we we should have the resources to be able to vaccinate a whole ton of people if we're willing to throw them at the problem. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, you know, I mean, it's it is there's there's a level of insanity that goes around that I can't wrap my head around some days. They set up a large vaccination point at Dodger Stadium mm -hmm. in Los Angeles yeah. where they were doing 1,500, 2,000 vaccines a day. Yeah. And, and for a very brief period during one of the days, they shut down the entrance to it because there were a bunch of people protesting yeah. vaccines. I'm like, I, 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 how did this happen? You know, it's like going on the internet when you hear somebody said they believe that the earth is flat and <laughs> typing in flat earth and seeing, you know, 20,000 hits of people trying to scientifically justify <laughs> that the world is flat. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm all, I'm all in for free speech. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I'm all in for the First Amendment of the Constitution and all of the great freedoms that we have here. Yeah. But free to be stupid is not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's bizarre. I saw pictures on um, social media of of the cars at Dodger Stadium and, and uh, the lines, people waiting. Yeah. And, and then that they had to shut it down. I'm like, I couldn't believe it. I, I truly, I mean, but, but then again, like every other day, something comes out of America and I think, wow, I just, well, I did not see that coming. Watching it from afar, you probably experience this where you look back and you go, that doesn't remind me of the place where I lived or grew up. Mm, yeah. Right. I don't, I don't understand where we took this really weird turn to to where and it's and as and as much as I'd like to say it was a Donald Trump thing, it's not. It goes yeah. way back before way him. Down. Yeah. Um it's just he was just the the kind of a catalyst for uh, a whole lot of mess. So yeah, yeah. I remember um I had this conversation with um a friend of mine who was um an attorney in LA um that I feel like maybe 15, 20 years ago, maybe more than that, I remember this kind of change where, for example, there were lots of, of banners up uh, really promoting the military. Um, hometown. Yeah. Hero, that's um, after 9-11, certainly. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, it, there was a change in that regard. And I completely understand it. And I, I never, ever want to uh, speak disparagingly of, of any of our, our, our family, our friends who are in, in the military. But it was an interesting PR campaign that it was all about the military for, you know, the hometown hero thing, because yeah. I, I get where you're coming from, but also to me, there are other hometown heroes, like a fireman that goes into a burning yeah. building. Yeah. And, yeah. and I felt like it was just at the expense of other people who should be celebrated. It was all about military might. And, yeah. and that was something that never set well with me. And that was for me personally, that was where I started to feel a disconnect because it was 
becoming a culture that glorified war. And that that's just, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> Uh, for me, I guess, just simply because I'm old, um, <laughs> I, I kind of feel like things took a turn um, back with Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. because he brought the religious right into politics mm -hmm. yeah. where they yeah. were traditionally separate um, because he wanted the voting block, right? And, yeah. one, and yeah. at this point, now that they've gotten in, right, they've taken it over. To a, lot, to a large extent. And uh, I don't believe that the ones that have taken it over, I'm not a particularly religious person myself, but I don't believe the ones that have taken it over actually represent even truly religious people, right? Yeah. I think that um, there's a little too much hate. There's <laughs> a yeah. little too much um, not actually living by the word that they claim they're living by. Yeah. Um, that's obvious. And um and yet politicians, so uh, I don't know how the election system works in the UK, but you know how it works here. Uh, it's the, our primary system is broken, right? Yeah, yeah. Because in order to get on the general election, you have to win your primary for your party. And the only people who show up for the party primaries are the wingnuts on either side. Right. Yeah, on the right. on the liberal side, you have to be way, way to the left. And on the conservative side, you have to be like way, way to the right in order to win your primary. And then historically, the candidates come back into the center when they go into the uh, they go into the general elections. Well, what's happening now is uh, between the historic. I mean, we just had a uh, historic turnout for a presidential election. Yeah. But um there's been a drop off over years of the number of people who bother voting. And so you wind up with the extremes pushing the candidates to their extreme in the main elections. And that's what you get mm, in office. Yeah. And it's just been, it's just, it's, it's, it's a broken system that yeah. uh, unfortunately the people who need to fix it are the ones who are broken. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. And I don't think it's, it's, all that different here. There's sort of certainly populist politics have have taken the day, but um, but I, the interesting thing about religion is once I moved here, settled in, it kind of dawned on me that um, a the the queen is the head of the Church of England, so okay. that means that there is no separation of church and state; they're intertwined. Right. Okay. Fact. However. I find just in day-to-day -day life, it's so much less oppressively religious. Now, I grew up in the South, so that did sort of change things. But I remember anytime I'd visit the South, you, somebody asks, hey, how are you? What's your name? What church do you go to? I mean, it's literally the second thing they ask you. And then they will judge you by that. Oh, well, you know, you're not going to be saved if you don't go to First Baptist. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it, truly, they will make judgments based on that. And no one ever asks here if you go to church. If, if, and if they're asking about a church, they probably want to know if you've um, gone to the you know, the, the Saturday farmer's market <laughs> in front of the church or, or possibly the, the church has been converted into luxury apartments. So. <laughs> <laughs> now I assume there's a diverse religious, uh, d religions are diverse in, in there anyway. Right. I mean, it's not, everybody goes to the queen's church, right? Uh, well, that, that's an interesting one to answer because uh, if you look at, there's churches all over the place and they're almost entirely church of England. Okay. Um, it's rare to find a Catholic church because, well, the big yeah. ones, Henry the eighth kind of like pillaged them and took all yeah. their gold and, you know, yeah. Yeah. And stuff, right? uh, yeah. there's not that many around. Um, yeah, but there are lots of other religions that are practiced, of course. Um, sure. But in regard the percentage of the population, it's still pretty small. And that was on my life in the UK test. So if I thought really hard, I could tell you what they were. Oh, no, it's, that's I mean, okay. less than 5%. Okay. It's interesting. It's the whole uh, homogenous society versus heterogeneous society kind of thing, right? It's yeah. our, our diversity is one of our greatest characteristics because it brings uh, richness to the cultural experience. And it's the worst thing in the world at the same time, because it gives everybody an excuse to hate everybody else. Um, yeah, you know, that's human nature, though. You're always going to find an us and them. 
Yeah, you're right. It's human nature. It happens everywhere. And it's all of our responsibilities to at least be conscious of it yeah. um, so that we can try to not do it. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think, depending on circumstances, um, it can be uh, interested in in variety and, and chance to learn something new. And when we are under stress, especially if we feel that our resources are in danger, I think that's when we revert back to the caveman yep. uh, hoarding thing about like, oh, you're going to steal my food. Yeah. Um, the, in the we, tribalism brains. <laughs> yeah. We become really tribal that way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's where I think it becomes dangerous. But I think that uh, often the the press um, will put us in a fear state of of being that. You mean constant breaking news uh, flashing across the screen? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, me- the media, it, between the media and social media, you just kind of want to lock yourself in a in a closet and, and cut off the whole world, but you can't because you got to know what's going on, right? It's right, been wait. interesting. Yeah. Well, it is interesting because that essentially is what the pandemic has done. It's just, with the exception of the social media aspect, you're locked in a closet, okay? Yeah. Tick. Got that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the one thing I've noticed is when I'm super busy at work, so, you know, working like uh, 12 hour days, then I'm not really on social media that much. So I don't kind of know what's going on. I only need, I can tell you about the weather. I can tell you about when the full moon is. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so connected <laughs> to nature right now because I sit and look outside and, you know, typey type on, on my laptop but th- that's my entire world. And it's it's been a really interesting experiment for just a little slice of time to imagine what it is to to live outside of, of a media circus and social media circus. Yeah. Well, I'm trapped in the middle of the circus because I have, <laughs> been, I have been out of work since November of 2019. Oh, my God. And I am just I'm trapped at home. <laughs> mm-hmm. I come down into my office. I look for a job, <laughs> you know, um, do my uh, submissions. Occasionally something comes back, usually not. And then, uh, you know, it gets to a certain point in the afternoon where it's like, okay, what are we going to do now? I know. Let's go troll Twitter for a while. Uh, it's one of the reasons I started the podcast because I needed a creative outlet. You know, yeah. one can sit and study uh, Python and Scrum Master certifications for just so long yeah. before you need something that feeds the soul. So funny story, you'll appreciate this. Back in December of last year, I'm going to say November, December of last year, a friend of mine who I had working with me at DreamWorks, he calls me up one day and he says, Jeffrey, I met this lady. She's a manager and I think you'll be perfect with her. You need to call her. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, Dave. So he gives me her number. And, and knowing Dave the way I know Dave, if I didn't call her, he would hound me to the end of my life. So <laughs> I call her and we talk a little bit. And so the next thing you know, I have a, I have a theatrical manager again. Okay. And of course, I haven't had the chance to have professional photos done yet. So we just took a good selfie. Um, and, and, and back in, it was January, probably, I actually had my first audition in 30 years. What? I didn't get the part, but that's okay. Because, you know, I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, you know, I had just recently been out of work at that point. And now I, there's hope of being an actor again. Of course, then the pandemic came along and, and has mostly put a bullet in that. But, you know, there's this whole universe of possibility out there. <laughs> wow. See, that's, that, I'm, I'm so fascinated by this because... So, and I don't remember how this happened, but I somehow subscribed to a service for um, little acting jobs. So I get emails, uh, gosh, a couple of times a week about, oh, apply for this job. We need somebody to do a voice on this thing. Work from home. I'm like, oh, really? And then I... Of course, I always end up like, oh, I'll apply for that later. And then I forget. And then it's past. So so I haven't actually done it yet. But I, I did kind of fantasize about like, well, what would that be like? I can, do you audition from home these days? Can I yeah. use my phone camera? When all of that started to happen, I decided, okay, maybe I should get more involved in SAG again. Because I've maintained my SAG after membership all these years. Yeah. Um, and started paying attention to things. And 
SAG does a lot of really good webinars that talk about how to do remote auditions because casting directors are taking tapes now instead of in person, right? right? They're not doing live interviews. And so, yes, you can shoot your monologue on your iPhone and what equipment should you have at home to do it and that kind of thing. It's a very different business now than it was when it was, you know, back when I was actually doing it for a living and it was more formal. It's, it's very technology dependent. So yeah. And, and having a microphone like this in your house, because you sound great right now, you could do voiceover work without a doubt. So there you go. I should, another another yeah. option. Well, although uh, I, I know you've got some great stories too about um, just bizarro auditions. I mean, it, I felt like in LA, certainly, I don't think I went to very many auditions where the casting director wasn't eating a bucket of fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was fried chicken, but it was always something. Yeah, they're you know, always eating. They're always eating. Well, you know, I would have to think that it's probably an incredibly boring job to be <laughs> sitting there all day watching people come in and do the exact same lines over and over and over again. Um, and then have to sort through them later to pass the better ones up. I think you save your your critical eye and your energy for when you have to review them afterwards. Yeah. And so while they're going through the process, you're just kind of like, hmm, I'm thinking about other things because I want my mind to be clear and fresh later. Yeah. But yeah, I've yeah, it's um casting was always a fun, fun thing. My I yeah. <laughs> I, I do miss it, though. I do. I miss doing that. I, I, I look back, you know, having been home for a year, I've had a lot of time to look back on my life yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and think about the places where I took a left when I should have taken a right. Um, and um, I came to the conclusion that my mother, God rest her soul, whose philosophy in life was never, you know, always be prepared, always have a backup in case it doesn't work out, was completely wrong. The only way to be a, a successful actor in this world is to put all of your eggs in one basket because otherwise it's too easy to get comfortable to go off and do something else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's really true. Yeah. So um, what, what are you looking forward to the most when the world opens up again and things get back to normal? Oh, pub. <laughs> <laughs> that's so easy. Um, yeah. And, and it's funny because, we thought about this back in during the first lockdown because now we're in lockdown number three hundred and eighty five. And the the first one, when we knew that one was going to ease up, I knew exactly what I was going to do, which was go on a long run, which I do on Sundays. I run okay. ten k every Sunday, uh, and then so I get really hungry, and then go into a pub and have a Sunday roast with okay. friends and have beers, have wine. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. And it was so glorious. You know, the, the Irish have a great phrase, which is hunger makes good sauce, meaning that any food is amazing if you're really hungry. <laughs> and it's true. But especially a Sunday roast, which at a, at a good pub, they're fantastic anyway. And then being super hungry after running, and then being back in the pub, which in the pub, there's something really special to me and to a lot of people about the pub atmosphere. And, you know, the basic idea is it's a public house is what it is. Right. For. So this is where all the community events used to take place in the pub. And to some extent, they still do. So people have tiny houses. So you don't have to invite people over because then you'd have to, you know, like clean and stuff. So right. Just, yeah. You just go to the pub. So if you want to have like a baby shower, you go to the pub. So And there's and there's one on every corner. It's it's a neighborhood yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. You got your local and you know the you know them, they know you. They have your drinks ready when you show up. It, it's it it's like cheers. Everyone knows your name. <laughs> and but it's true. It really is like that it becomes like a family. And there's something very special about that atmosphere and um for anyone cutting down on their drinking, you'll be happy to know they have a wide selection of non-alcoholic drinks these days. So. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That sounds that sounds truly wonderful. 
It really does. Yeah, yeah. So that is absolutely what I'm looking that and then right after that, trip to Paris. Ah, yes. Very cool. I'd like to go back there again someday. Yeah, yeah. And it's um Paris is such a magical place to me, especially for people watching. Yeah. The first times I kept saying like, whoa, you know, I'm going to go and check this out, see the tower, blah, 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 and then go to the Louvre. I think I ended up not going to the Louvre until my seventh visit to Paris (laughs) because I just got so entrenched watching people. There's something about sitting in the cafes. Yep. And, yep. and just sitting there with coffee or a glass of wine is watching people walk by. It's, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, um, okay. I have one last thing I want to say, and that is you have developed the most charming British accent over, <laughs> over the last decade. Um, <laughs> it's, it's there. It's very subtle. It's on accenting on the words and it's absolutely absolutely charming so um it's got a little bit almost a little mary poppins poppins (laughs) thing going on there um and um, (laughs) and uh i really want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me today this has been really fantastic oh thank you i am absolutely delighted to chat with you it has been way too long